Hey, this is Mike, and everybody watches AccessTV.org. Everybody watches accesstv.org. Welcome to our show, Conversation. Today, we have honored guest of Mr. Cliff Thornton, whose bio is so long I'm going to read it so I don't miss anything, and Mr. Kevin Muhammad, an educator, and we'll also get an idea of his organization. Uh, perhaps we'll do that first. Your organization is... The organization is the Connecticut African American Emancipation Challenge. Uh, we're a, a collective group of uh, individuals from different towns in Connecticut, from Hartford, New Haven, Bridgeport, Waterbury, and we decided that we would maximize our efforts uh, since blacks are African Americans, they say make up six to eight percent of the population. We decided to take on uh, various issues as a unified entity because we felt there was a need for unity if we were going to make any changes. So uh, our organization has primarily taken up the issue of the war on drugs and all of its implications and uh, components, which is the problem with incarceration, decline of our families, um, drug um, abuse, drug use, uh, lack of jobs, employment, lack of education. All of that, we believe, stems from this whole 40-year monster war on drugs. And concerning the war on drugs, our expert here is Mr. Clifford Thornton. Okay. Uh, in the last five years, Mr. Thornton has spoken to over 400,000 people on drug reform and some 750 billions all over the U.S., Australia, Canada, Europe, and New Zealand. Mr. Thornton has completed over 400 radio shows and numerous television spots on drug policy reform as it relates to health, race and class, and economics. He's described as America's foremost anti-drug African-American activist by Amherst College online newspaper. Mr. Thornton and his wife founded www.fcconline.org, a nonprofit organization to educate the world about drug policy reform. Now, I'm so glad that Mr. Thornton made me you know, invite Mr. Muhammad. And uh, perhaps you can tell me a little bit about this marriage, so to speak, of uh, <laughs> expert in organization. <laughs> well, Mr. Lee, you know I didn't make you, but uh, I strongly suggested that you invite Kevin because Kevin is, is one of the leaders within the community, within the, the state of Connecticut, that is pushing this issue. But understanding, as most people do, that this issue is uh, related to everything we do in society. So in order to reach the goals of, let's say, no more killings in the community, uh, looking at how we can uplift the black, brown, and poor white communities to get better jobs and get education, and show what this monster called the war on drugs has actually done to the community. Uh, basically black and brown um, community is sending these people to prison. So this is a monumental problem and I've been doing this work for over two decades and every year I come back and I said next year is going to be worse and understanding that the next year is always worse. We don't have the investment that is needed within the black and brown 
in poor white community to build an economic base. We're not even educating our, our children the way in which we should educate our children. Because what we have done with this drug war is we have taken potential tax earners out of the community, put them in prison, and paid taxes to keep them there. That's double jeopardy. So I think it's time for people to wake up. And, and for the most part, a lot of people have woken up. From the time I started doing this work, I see a lot more people, especially black people, are on board with this issue and pushing to end this drug war. Support, support of the people. Uh, in our earlier conversation, we were talking how key it is that the voter get out and put those people in office who are serious enough and not to have them thinking that the drug issue is something they can address or not address at their whim. Uh, Kevin, uh, tell me, an organization like yours, uh, yours what type of things do you think that you can do to help support this effort as put forth by Mr. Thornton? I think people have to realize that in America, politicians are actually, they're actually controlled. And they're controlled by um, great lobbyist groups. They're controlled by people who have the dollars. But people who are pockets of voters that actually come together for vested interest. And when a mayor or a governor wants to get elected, they understand that the, uh, you know, the, um, this, you know, the, the, the tire that's squeaking the most is going to get the oil. You know, so people that are quiet, they don't say anything, they don't come together, no one's going to look your way and do anything in your vested interest. And so when politicians move out, they look at groups and pockets of people that may not be united in terms of physical togetherness, but they're united in terms of their vested interests. So they're able to come together, put their money together, and support a politician that will be their mouthpiece. What we have to understand is we need to get involved. We need to register to vote. We need to come together, but understand that this war on drugs is devastating our families. It's devastating our future. Uh, it's devastating our educational system. And so it's, it's such that everyone in the community should come together and say, wait a minute, we're not only going to register to vote, we're going to find people to put in office that are going to stand up against this war on drugs. Because it's not really a war against drugs at all. There's been more drugs available. There's been more people in prison. It's basically a, a war on people. And until we realize and take it personally and say, wait a minute, we have no other choice. we got to get out here. And my job is to be the trumpet and let people know the urgency that you got to get up off your backsides and come together. And not only that, we got to find people that we're going to put in office that speak for our vested interests. So that's where the political piece comes in. And your response, and just concentrating on like three words, the element of early consideration of community, mm -hmm. government, and the elected officials um, to localize this thing. Let's talk about Connecticut. Uh, it's my understanding that uh, your organization has met with different members of you know the communities in the in, within certain of our larger cities, and to get an idea of what they thought was the biggest issues, you know, of their communities of their cities. And in our New Haven, that you determined that that was the focal point of your organization's mm -hmm. effort so far as against drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very interesting dichotomy to when you talk about New Haven. I always thought of like New Haven and. Uh, the criminal element, okay, but you also have New Haven and Yale University. Sure. You know, something. So, and if this one community is there's a drug problem, I would assume that it touches, you know, both the academic community at the highest level, mm -hmm. okay, and the street community. So, mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. seems to be very interesting that 
Yeah, well, That's the focal point of your groups. It's right. also complex because Yale is also the president making entity of the world. Mm. And the president of the United States is, because of policy and drug policy, he enables a lot of this to take place and has the power to either uh, um, stop it or allow it. So if the, if we allow it, then we, we can say that the president enables the allowance of drugs to be sold to, to, for this war on drugs to perpetuate itself. And so you're looking at an institution that prepares a person, it, it's, it, and I'm not being facetious, to sell drugs. Mm -hmm. And so, but at the, it, you also prepare the attorneys who further this criminal justice system. And attorneys are going to uh, now get jobs where they're going to be representing people who are plea bargaining and entering into prison. And 60 to 70 percent of us are in prison because of drug enforcement laws. So the, the, the both go hand in hand that this entity is preparing people that are actually continuing the perpetuation of the war on drugs and also on the other side of Dixwell and Whaley Avenue, the poor community, the people who are suffering and at the hand of this war on drugs. So one is perpetuating the oppression and the other is being subjected by those who are perpetuating the oppression. When you mention the president mm -hmm. as one of those people who, I guess by design, mm -hmm. uh, may be a perpetuator of this, uh, then you would have to say Locally, the governor, uh, Cliff, you were a candidate for the governor of Connecticut, and you also are a power at B within the Green Party, I believe. At one time. At, yeah. at one time. At one time. Uh, so I'm thinking with your expertise and your understanding of the governmental process that you would have a game plan as to how a governor might positively affect to solve this drug problem, what he might do, whether or not he might uh, create a situation where legislation is like, you know, enforced. Uh, if Obama can create Obamacare, could Malloy create a, a denial of drugs for you? Know, and would you be able to counsel him? In well, some manner? I, I met Governor Malloy when I ran for governor in 2006. He didn't get the nod then in 2006. Um, the Stefano, the mayor of New Haven, got the nod then. But I had conversations with Malloy, and Malloy said he what he wanted to do was decriminalize marijuana and have medical marijuana. He, at present, is the most progressive governor in the country in that the bills for decriminalization of marijuana and medical marijuana came directly from his office. There is no other governor in the land who has done that. So I would have to say that looking at him, he is the most progressive governor on this particular issue in the country. Now, the next thing is possibly looking at the outright legalization of uh, or regulation and control of marijuana. But understand, too, that federal law super, supersedes state law. And the reason why the Obama cannot back out is because of international treaties saying that no country w within the international treaties would uh, regulate drugs. But what we're finding is you have Uruguay and uh, Bolivia looking to opt out of the international treaties because they're looking at um, uh, legalizing marijuana and uh, the cocoa leaf. So it's a paradox. And things are going to change, but th they're going to change in the next, I think, three to four years internationally with more countries coming on to legalize drugs. Through in the Southern Hemisphere, they've been having conference after conference talking about how they're going to legalize drugs. So coming back to your original question, talking about Malloy, yes, Malloy is very progressive. 
I would definitely lend my expertise to them. The key here is to watch and see how medical marijuana is going to be implemented. We're going to learn a lot of lessons from that in that we're going to start to see where the money is going to go. The money can't just go up. The money's got to come down into the community. And see, that's, those are the things that I would fight for. There can't be legalization without some type of indemnification slash reparations. Because it's not the drugs that's causing the problem. It is the drug policies, the laws on the books today. Well, when you say the community, you say like a town, a city. I mean, uh, how do you identify the people of Hartford, uh, people of Glastonbury? You know, would you give them the capability of partaking within medical, the manufacture of medical marijuana? Well, it, it's, always, it, it's already stipulated that pharmacies would be the only licensed people that could distribute the medical marijuana. The growers would be determined uh, by the state, which, which they, they will be or are already mm -hmm. determined. There's nothing coming out on that. The medical marijuana program will be implemented in October of this year within the state of Connecticut. So we, we, we are waiting to see how, in fact, exactly how it's going to be implemented. Now, with that information, would your group be active in monitoring that? Because a lot of times, you, you know, things go uh, on the books, and it creates a certain industry, a certain amount of regulation, okay? And if the average citizen is not aware that that has to be manned with, and populated with people, so far as to be able to manage that effort, okay. So now, are your kind of group going to be able to give the bigger cities a fair share in this perhaps manufacturing process of America? No, I think I think our group is is not to monitor that. I think our group is to um, to find people that can represent us to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think is our group is to look at our political landscape. Uh, in cities like Bridgeport, in cities like New Haven, in Hartford, and look who's for the vested interest of the people. Look at the overall picture of the war on drugs and its, and its effect. Uh, for instance, the black market value. One of the reasons why we have to see this, what's going on with drugs as prohibition, is we're really good at looking at movies of Al Capone and, and what people were able to make off of alcohol when alcohol, under the prohibition mm -hmm. time. And it became a black market, and people became rich, and gangsters began to kill, and people began to go to jail, and lives were lost. And when they decided to, to legalize alcohol, it cut out the black market value. In other words, I couldn't make a whole lot of money on the street because government regulated and controlled the supply. So if you told a brother who was, and this is the other thing. We're crying over gun control laws, but the reason why we're crying over gun control laws is basically because of the war on drugs. Because we're using drugs, we're using guns in our community to protect drug territory. And, we, and we're killing each other because of gang warfare. And gang warfare is basically territorized based on, I got control of this community because I'm making my money versus this community. It, it dehumanizes people to where now we're killing innocent babies bystanders. So if you had a brother on the block that wasn't going to make any more money than he would work at Walmart, why am I going to get shot and murdered and killed when I could, I could do something else? This is where government steps in and says, wait a minute, this, idem this indemnification. So instead of you shooting and killing yourself, we're going to take you and train you and educate you that you could be of some use. No one is crying out for the poor brother and sister that's in prison, that has a felon. And because of the criminalization of drugs and can't get a job. If they decriminalized it, then we can take that money from medical marijuana, other things, and educate the brother and sister in the community. And then we would restore the self-esteem, the value, the, the, the worth, and then maybe we would not be killing each other as much. So our job is to make people look at it and, and, and make it palatable and make sense and say, we ought to get up against this war on drugs because I lost my cousin, I lost my niece, uh, there's a gun problem in our community, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and I think uh, we're not putting together the pieces and saying, 
ah, this is all be due to this war on drugs. Mm -hmm. And that's how, we, uh, that's how we're seeing it is in, our, in our organization. And understand yes, this sir. too, there, there's the flip side to that. And I've heard many, many women say this, is that <clears throat> their son, their black son has a job in the prison system. I'm not really interested in seeing the war on drugs stop because it supplies him with a job. And see, this is what we talk about, vested interest in keeping this thing going. We're starting to see the um, decrease in um, the prison population, slowly but surely. And when you start to look at the $3 billion deficit of the state of Connecticut, you see at the core of this deficit is the drug war with all its trappings, the prison system um, and all of those ancillary things that are needed to perpetuate it through the criminal justice system. So we're, we're starting to wake up, but we're not waking up fast enough because this thing is a monster and it's, it's, it's killing it's killing the people, not, not, just, not just literally shooting and killing them, but it's killing people economically. It's stripping away their, their uh, wherewithal to, to try and make it. It's a devastating policy. Well, some, the the all-inclusiveness of the problem, uh, I'm going to refer to, I guess it's some literature that came out of from your site, but I'm not exactly sure. And it's basically we're talking about the war on drugs is a war on following elements, justice, race, and class, public health, addicts, taxpayers, science, compassion, democracy, marijuana, civil liberties, higher education, prevention, industrial hemp, truth, reason, and environment. That's a very broad spectrum of things that are components of this total effort and you have a person like yourself, you have an organization like yourself, okay? Everybody needs support. You have a governor who is willing to work hard at it, but he needs support. Uh, what other means of support we'll just say like media wise would you need to bring the consciousness up to consciousness, obviously, it's a, it's a, you know, it's a, a, a drug, a war on drugs, so it's being covered. You know, someone's addressing the problem. That's what the average citizen might think. What can the average citizen do, and how has, does he have to be made aware of what he should do? Well, first and foremost, the average citizen has to become educated, and they have well, I'd say reluctant because of their daily lives. They're not really interested in this particular problem until it hits them directly. Most people aren't aware of it. it, it it's, it's taken time to educate the people, but that's come around, seeing that I, the way in which I've been doing this so long that I've watched this thing change and I've watched people become aware of this problem in a greater degree than it was when I first started doing this, thing, this stuff. So the support is slowly but surely coming. However, we're still fighting those entities within our own backyard that are unwilling to talk about this, this particular problem the way in which it should be and are unwilling to, to wear the mantra to get this thing going because basically this war on drugs is a broad civil rights issue. You know, and I've seen one of the things that I, I try to I'm not a major media person uh, because okay. I think listening to a lot of Fox News and major media, it's like eating bad food. <laughs> uh, and sooner or later, if you digest too much of it, it becomes a part of you. Yeah. So I, I try to uh, look at entities like um, law enforcement against prohibition, officers, judges, mm -hmm. people who have seen the disaster and have the authority to see how the laws were enforced, how they jailed people, what happened? I try to look at um, writings like you know people like uh, Gary Webb from San Jose Mercury News and others that saw how people were benefiting from lives lost because they wanted to bring cocaine to America and and, and imprison people and, and and make a lot of money and how Wells Fargo and other banks 
laundered this money and people became rich off of the lives of, of imprisoning people. And so one of the things that I think, one of my visions is, you know, every real true ministerial alliance, the black community, at the end of the day, we get a lot of information from church. We get a lot of information from those entities that we've relied on. Okay, and if we're talking about sure. information, though, sure. information and education, sure. uh, why not take advantage of the media? You know, why not use it? Why not distance learning? I know there's your whole entities, you know, this organization, Access TV mm -hmm. is an organization okay, who is very mean. willing mm -hmm. to get involved with right. distance learning and to devote X amount of channels right. Right. to I, a drug problem. Well, I, I agree that in independent media, because the, the media is a controlled entity, right. and right. more so than ever. Right. Uh, so I'm talking about the controlled media. I'm talking about Viacom and those multinational corporations that are also in cahoots with the people that benefit mm -hmm. from the war on drugs. Now, what, I'm, what I wanted to break down was word of mouth. 500 people, 1,000 people in a mega church with a ministry alliance and, and ministers that are well versed on the war on drugs. And just like we use scripture for anything else, we could parallel how I don't see how you could, you could teach on liberation or liberation theology or healing of the sick or anything else and then leave out how the war on drugs is against that. So using your, your, your spirituality, your, your religiosity, to teach the truth about this war on drugs because it's it's just opposed to the well-being of the people that you are ministering over. Mm -hmm. So if, if you can do that, the other thing is that there are some churches that benefit from the war on drugs because prison ministry is, is a person that has little next to no education, that has a church, can benefit by prison ministry. But Prison ministry for what? Prison ministry because they're imprisoning people from these drug policies. Well, so some of some of some of those are are, are direct contravention to the some people benefiting from from the ignorance of those. One of the know. areas that they should the, the war on drugs is a war on the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Absolutely. And that has to be inclusive of you know how spirituality is brought to you know. The, the public again it's a message it's information how do you get it done what are your ideas on it Cliff, about well how you get this message over to enough people I, I know what Kevin is saying Kevin originally talked about when you take in all of this stuff especially from Fox News what it actually does is it warps your mind but uh, we realize that we have to take it, uh, advantage of the media. This is why we're here mm -hmm. this morning, because we know that this particular program is going to be aired on, I don't know how many times, but mm -hmm. the people will get to see it. And any type of, of information that is aired publicly it, is good for the community. It's another thing whether or not they believe you. But like I said, doing this work all this time, I'm finding more and more people believing. The thing is, now you have to get off, off your duff and do something positive. And one of the things that you can do positive is to, first of all, make sure you're registered, and secondly, make sure you vote. The third thing you're going to have to start thinking about is people like Kevin, uh, they're going to have to start looking at how they're going to run for public office. Because these people are the people that you know are going to be the voice of the people that don't that feel that they don't have a voice. So this is why that people who are in community uh, leadership roles are going to have to look seriously as to how they're going to run for office because they become the best voice for the people. In that, could you also say that the people have to create their own voice also? They have to start making each other aware of the vices of drugs, the vices of crime. You, you know, I, 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 I look at um, social media, and I, and I have a lot of Facebook friends, some that are uh, in academia, some that are in the world of spiritual, and some that are in the world of the street. And I find that anything in a, in a town like Bridgeport or New Haven, all we have to do is talk it up and everybody knows about it. Mm -hmm. If there's a shooting, it's within an hour we know who's been shot, whose son it is, 
what street, who his family is. I think that we, we have to realize that we do have entities that we could use that are powerful. Social media has changed the world and how, like now when you read an article, if you like it on Facebook, persons that have to even go to the paper or the source, they can read it off of your uh, status. And that's how they get their news. They get their news by watching my statuses. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, I dedicate a lot of the, 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 the Connecticut African American Emancipation Challenge page on current black issues. And then, wow, here comes Clifford Wallace with his piece. And he, he, was, and, he, he, and he relates that to what's that. going on in the black community. Right. Now people are saying, wow, you know, yeah. so there's a method to the madness. And I think not only independent media, but radio. Uh, recently, we, I had a, um, a, a meeting with uh, this group that connects hip hop and law enforcement. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and even the, 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 the rap world even looked at the war on drugs and saw that um, certain things that they glorify, um, basically ignorance of how the war on drugs plays out, you know, because I, I, I think once they're also educated on the war on drugs, and, and if they really want money, if they really want to have a future of, 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 of prosperity and, and bling bling, then a lot of it could be generated through the money that we throw away to the war on drugs. And so I'm just, you know, it's just so many different ways to communicate this really? to people. It's really a thought-provoking subject, and it's a huge subject. Very much so. I feel, you know, and I'm, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. And it's, I would love for your return, because half of the things that Cliff here uh, is aware of could help America with, you know, gets left out in such a short segment as we have. Well, the, the next time you have us here, make sure you... you there will be a next time. Yeah. Well, That's I, great. I think it will be. Fine. Uh, just lay out the questions and send us a copy of the questions so we could delve into it uh, and answer um, explicitly what you're asking. Because it's a broad subject. It's a huge subject. I would also have liked to use the, that report out of uh, Central Connecticut because it had a lot of things that were specific to Connecticut. And I think be, being that we're in Connecticut, people have to see the numbers, they have to see the facts, they have to see what's going on. So their mouths can drop open as to how much money is being wasted in this war on drugs and how much money will be available for the schools to educate people, to clothe people, and, and to house people. So far as we're able to, and you know, bring this to a close, that you know, we would like very much to be to dedicate our efforts here here at uh, Access TV to informing the public, whether it's through my program Conversatio or interviewing gentlemen like yourself, or letting the public be aware of they can develop programs. You know, they can have their own TV programs on the problems. There's enough areas. Absolutely. Yeah. And we would be perfectly willing to a lot X amount of work as time for that function. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining me.